Thank you, Elihan and Christia, Colin and Peyton for leading us in that beautiful item, leading us to Calvary. It was 1915, 30,615 Australian and New Zealand soldiers, full of excitement and a sense of adventure, had headed off to war on distant shores with little or no experience. They were ill-prepared for what they were heading into. The First World War was well underway. The battle on the Western Front had reached something of a stalemate, and Britain had decided that an attack elsewhere, particularly Turkey, could be the best way to win the war. From February 1915, this took the form of naval operations aimed at forcing a passage through the Dardanelles Strait. But after several setbacks, largely due to, to the sea mines, it was decided that a land campaign was also necessary. Three amphibious landings were planned to secure the Gallipoli Peninsula, which would allow the Navy to attack the Turkish, cap Turkish capital of Constantinople. That this would convince the Turks to agree to an armistice, an end to the fighting, and a possible renegotiation around the war. This is where we entered the war. On the morning of the 25th of April, 16,000 Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, Anzacs for short, aboard battleships, approached what is now known as Anzac Cove. Just before dawn, they descended down the ladders on the front of their boats into the water. They landed together a bit further north than intended. And as they waded through deep water in the darkness, toward the shore, their assault formations are reported to have become mixed. And the companies and battalions were forced to make new piecemeal plans on the run. As heavy artillery bombardments came down on them from above, Many were killed as they made their way to more protected higher ground. Some reached their objectives while still others were ordered to dig in. Many poised precariously on the sides of steep and exposed terrain. By nightfall, more than 2,000 Anzacs had either been killed or wounded, with a similar number of casualties on the Turkish side. Our entry into the war was a difficult one, but throughout the next eight months, it remained difficult. And our positions there on that Anzac Cove barely changed until the British came to remove our troops eight months later. But during that time, the Anzacs earned an, an amazing reputation. A reputation for great courage, endurance, initiative, discipline, and mateship. Values that continue to underpin the best of what it means to be Australian today. And so, since 1916, Anzac Day has been a time of remembrance on which we acknowledge not only those who fought in the First World War, but all Australians and New Zealanders who have served and died in all wars, conflicts and peacekeeping operations and the contribution of those who have suffered whilst serving. Considered by most Australians to be one of the most sacred days in our calendar, on it we remind ourselves and our younger generations in our midst the price paid for our freedom and the call to continue to live by those same values of the Anzacs. But before we share any further, let me take just a moment to speak to a couple of questions that may be with us today. Well might we ask, isn't Anzac Day just glorifying war? And is that something we should be doing? No. Anzac has become a time to express gratitude and respect to all those who have risen to protect our freedoms. It's not a time to glorify war. Some here might say, well, that's fine for regular Australians or for secular Australia. But what about for Christians? Is God a God of love like the Bible says he is? And isn't war something we should be doing our best to forget? 
And why are we even talking about Anzac Day in a worship service here in church? Well, before we jump to any hasty conclusions, let's just remind ourselves that throughout Scripture, God is constantly, yes, at war with his adversary. In fact, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a particular understanding of what we know as the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It began in heaven. It was won at the cross. It continues now over the allegiance of every person and your eternal fate. And one day it will be eternally concluded. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God at war with those who seek to destroy his people. In Exodus chapter 15, in the first few verses, you may remember the Red Sea crossing where the Israelites crossed over on dry ground through the sea. You remember what happened to the Philistine army and how Miriam and Moses led this singing on the other side. Have a look at what they sung. Oh, that verse isn't popping up, unfortunately. They sang, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots in his army he has hurled into the sea. So let me ask you, is this God of love also a God of war? And does that make sense to you? In the New Testament, Paul tells us that you and I are at war constantly. He encourages us in Ephesians 6 to put on the full armor of God. If God is not at war, why does he have an armory just for us? Paul seems in other places to turn around and call God the God of peace. John tells us God is love. So how do we reconcile to these two pictures of God? with the understanding that he is also a God of love and a God of war. Are these two things compatible? What do you think? Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, if we weren't confused already, says this. Listen to the words. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It shouldn't be hard for us to reason that a God of love must also be a God of war. A God of love must also be at war with anything and anyone that threatens his people. Is that fair? Parents, you love your children does that not also require that you are at war with anyone or anything that would threaten your child? It makes sense, doesn't it? God is indeed a God of love, and he is at war with all who would threaten his people. Notice in Scripture that God doesn't start the war. He rises to meet his adversary in war. Wars are typically started by selfishness, pride, greed, fear, none of which makes sense to any reasonable, rational person. But war makes all the sense in the world when your land is being invaded or when your people or your freedoms are under threat. When you think about it like that, I think we can be thankful that we have to remind ourselves of the benefits of what took place in Anzac Cove and since then. We should be thankful that war makes so little sense to us today. It means that we are living in a time of peace and we are not under threat of invasion. And so Anzac Day is not a day of celebrating the beginnings of wars, the starting of wars, but of celebrating those who rise to meet our adversaries and the threats to freedom. And as Christians, I believe we find incredible meaning in Anzac Day. We remember all who gave their lives, knowing that their sacrifice in war exemplifies values that we also can aspire to. Courage, 
determination, a fair go for everyone, mateship and sacrifice. Sacrifice. The greatest love there is and can be. The Bible says in John 15 verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This love is seen in the service of ordinary seamen. You ready, children? Edward Teddy Sheehan. Teddy, Teddy, Teddy. Teddy. <laughs> Just this past year, 1st of December, 2020, at Government House in Canberra, Governor General, General David Hurley presented the Victoria Cross posthumously to the Sheehan family. The Victoria Cross, as many of you will know, is the highest and most prestigious award in the British Honours System. It's awarded for valour in the presence of the enemy. At age 17, he enlisted in the Royal Australian Naval Reserve as an ordinary seaman. Following the steps of his five brothers who had joined the armed forces, four of them were in the army, one was in the navy. In May of 1942, Teddy Sheehan was posted to Sydney where he joined his first ship as an anti-aircraft gun loader. Granted home leave, he was not on board that ship when Japanese midget submarines raided the harbour and sank her on the 31st of May. Soon after, Teddy returned to Sydney and was assigned to this ship, the HMAS Armadale. The following month, on the 29th of November, the Armadale sailed for Japanese-occupied Timor in company with another corvette ship, the HMAS Castle Maine, to deliver fresh troops, withdraw exhausted ones, and evacuate about 150 Portuguese civilians. Arriving shortly before dawn on the 1st of December, the ships came under repeated attack from Japanese aircraft, as you see in this picture here. Despite requests, no air cover was received. Shortly before 2 p.m., Teddy's ship, Armadale, had been separated from the other ship and was attacked by no less than 13 enemy aircraft. The ship manoeuvred frantically. At 3.15, a torpedo struck her port side and another hit the engineering spaces. Finally, a bomb from above struck her toward the rear. As the vessel listed heavily to her port side, the order was given, abandon ship. The survivors leapt into the sea where they came under sustained attack from above in the fighter planes. Teddy Sheehan, after helping others to free a life raft, was hit himself by two bullets from one of the aircraft, wounding him in the back and the chest. Scrambling back across the deck, he strapped himself up into the anti-aircraft cannon and soon was shooting at the fighters in an effort to protect some of the sailors already in the sea. Soon after this, the 18-year-old sailor successfully shot down a bomber to the cheers of those in the life rafts. As you see in this painting, it's probably not accurate to his hair color and the style of the front of the ship, but the artist has successfully captured the spirit of Teddy Sheehan. As the Armadale stern, that's the rear of the boat, was engulfed by the sea, and the water began to rise above his feet, Teddy maintained his fire back and forth across the sky, tracing enemy planes with round after round. He hit another plane to the cheers of the men in the water, and as the waves rose around him, soon after another plane was shot to more cheers. The Armadale continued to, sh to sink, but Teddy remained focused to the end. As the gun slipped beneath the waves, Teddy continued firing his gun. His crewmates later testifying to seeing tracer bullets rising from beneath the water's surface as he was dragged under. 49 men 
of approximately 150 who had been on board survived that day. Many of them crediting their lives to Teddy Sheehan, a young man whose selfless actions capture all that is best about who we can be. What Australians collectively describe as the Anzac spirit. That image of him, Teddy Sheehan, strapped into the anti-aircraft gun atop a sinking ship against a horizon full of fighter planes will not soon be forgot by those soldiers, those sailors in the water, in their life rafts. Teddy Sheehan's Victoria Cross was actually the first VC awarded to a Royal Australian Navy crew member. Additionally, on the 1st of May 1999, going back some years, this submarine, the HMAS Sheehan, was launched by his sister, Ivy Hayes, and it carried the motto, can you see it? Fight on. Fight on. I'm sure you can see the obvious parallels to our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, your eternal Saviour, the one who willingly denied himself strapped himself in, as it were, stretched out his arms and was nailed to a cross, choosing to stay there until he died so that you could live. We understand that he didn't need to be there, but we needed him there. In his own words, we understand that with one word, he could have summoned 12 legions of angels to his Redemption, but he didn't. He chose to stay until the enemy was defeated and you and I had been redeemed. And today we're able to worship him not simply as the crucified Savior, but as the risen Lord Jesus Christ who lives and is here in our midst. We worship him as the one who comes soon to take all who wait for him home, all who've placed their faith in him. And if you haven't done that, you can do it today. But throughout the wars that Australia has served in, there's been countless brave souls who faithfully served their country, many of whom have been under-recognized throughout the years, some of whom I'd like for us to remember briefly today beginning with the indigenous Anzacs. In an era when they weren't even recognized as Australian citizens, when enlistment was forbidden under the Constitution, some 50 Aboriginal men are believed to have served on the Gallipoli Peninsula, with 13 of them killed. And because it was forbidden, indigenous enlistees didn't record their ethnicity on recruitment papers, so their efforts have been poorly recognized since. But there are some occasional pleasant surprises, like this one. Richard Norman Kirby, a Lance Corporal who served in Gallipoli, France and Belgium. The only reason he got known to us, said, a fan, uh, said one of the people at the War Memorial of Australia, was because a family member came to us and said, I've got some medals that I'd like to give the War Memorial. And there's a DC something or other in there. I think it'll be important to you guys. That DC something or other is the first medal you see there. It's actually the Distinguished Conduct Medal, second only to the Victoria Cross. Kirby was awarded the DCM for a single-handed attack on an enemy machine gun post in France in August 1918. He took a bullet wound to the head from which he died a week later. All in all, it's thought that up to 1,000 Aboriginal soldiers served in the Australian Imperial Force during World War I, with around 250 to 300 giving the ultimate sacrifice. After the war, as those that survived returned to their communities, get this, 
Sadly, they were not allowed to march on Anzac days. They were not citizens and they were not permitted to be part of the celebrations. And accordingly, because no one saw them, it skewed the perception of their service. But we can remember them. Secondly, I'd like to mention the incredible women who were involved in the war and left behind here in Australia to lead the effort from home in both the World War I and World War II and since. During World War I, women made a major contribution to the war effort. At the front as nurses, supporting the effort as admin staff, and at home, working and taking care of families that soldiers had to leave behind. According to the Australian Department of Defence, over 2,500 nurses joined active service during World War I with 423 of these serving in Australia. Since World War I, attitudes toward women serving in the military have changed radically, and women now fight alongside men in active duty. Maybe you've heard of this young lady by the name of Faye Catherine Howe, a daughter of a lighthouse keeper on Breaksea Island, 12 kilometres southeast of Albany in Western Australia. Her mother had passed away in 1914 and she was now looking after her father. There's a picture of her there. As a 15-year-old, she would wave to the ships of soldiers as they went past. And she would often sign Morse code back and forth to encourage the departing troops as they passed her island and the lighthouse on their way to war. For many, it was their last point of contact as they left bound for Europe and Egypt and soon after, she would receive lots of letters of thanks for the inspiration that she'd been. Some of you may have come across these artistic productions called The Giants. Uh, her story inspired this one, uh, where she is depicted as a young girl waving to the soldiers. And then finally, I'd like to speak of a special group known as the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. Many of you know who these people were. This was the name given to Australian, uh, sorry, by Australian soldiers to the Papua New Guinean carriers who during World War II were recruited to bring supplies up to the front and carry injured Australian troops down the Kokoda Trail during the, during the Kokoda campaign. In 1942, during the Pacific invasion, the Japanese had built up a force in the Gona region of Papua with the intention of invading Port Moresby. The key to the offensive was an overland trail across the Owen Stanley Ranges, known to most of us as simply the Kokoda Trail. It's approximately 160 kilometers long. Some of you here may have tramped it, hiked it uh, as an expedition. In places, it rises to over 2,000 meters elevation. It's covered in thick jungle, certainly was in those days short trees and tall trees tangled with vines. In August 1942, the Japanese task force broke through the Australian line, forcing Australians to retreat back along the Kokoda Trail. But as one digger has noted, speaking of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels, they carried stretches over seemingly impassable barriers, with the patient reasonably comfortable. The care they give to the patient is magnificent. If night finds the stretcher still on the track, they will find a level spot. They'll build a shelter over the patient. They'll make him as comfortable as possible, fetch him water and feed him if food is available, regardless of their own needs. They sleep for each side of the stretcher, and if the patient moves or requires attention during the night, this is given. These were the deeds of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels for us. It's noted also that no known injured soldier, soldier that was still alive was ever abandoned by the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels, even during heavy combat. We can remember them. And so to these people and so many more, we owe a great gratitude. And it's incumbent upon us lest we forget. You might remember just last year, we had Anzac Day of a different kind. 
It was celebrated in the driveways of homes around Australia and around parts of the world, certainly New Zealand. Our boys, Colin and Peyton, didn't ask permission for this because I knew I wouldn't get it, uh, played on our driveway uh, on their cellos, the last post. And I just will never forget, at the same time, 6 a.m., our neighbours being on their driveways. I remember directly opposite us, our neighbour Helen holding a candle. And when she heard the cellos, she came from her driveway around to our side. And there were just tears in her eyes. And after the boys had played, she came across uh, the road a little bit and she shared how special that had been for her. Still feel emotional thinking about the significance of what took place that day just in our little street and maybe in yours. As our neighbours came together, there was just a touching moment of sharing. We'd all been in lockdown for a little while at this stage, but to come around in a circle around themes so grand as the Anzacs and their sacrifice was a very special thing. I hope that tomorrow you'll make some effort to take part in some form of remembrance in a service or some opportunity near you. We do well to remember the Anzacs, but I think it does us good to participate somehow. If you look for locations near you, you'll find them on the RSL Australia website. Anzac Day is an opportunity for us as Australians and as people of peace, as Christians, to remember that we too must not just remember, but that we are called to be people of peace, which makes us people of war. We are people at war against injustice, against oppression, wherever we find it. We are called to be people of courage, determination, committed to equality and a fair go for all, to mateship and sacrifice. And as people who know Jesus personally, we are called to live and to breathe the greatest love of all, the greatest love known to humanity, the self-emptying love of Jesus who laid down his life for us. So let me ask you this today. Who in your life needs defending? Who in your life needs you to be at war on their behalf? Perhaps there are people in your workplace who are suffering unfairly, who need an advocate, someone to speak up and represent them. Maybe in your neighborhood there are single mums doing it tough doing war with the challenges of raising children alone and you could be a person of peace for them. Maybe you're at school or uni and someone you know or have seen is doing war with loneliness, always being on the edge of the crowd. Is there something you could do to be at war on their behalf, to be a person of peace, to sacrifice your comfort, to lift them up? Is there someone who needs you to decline your comfort of the lifeboats and to stand at the anti-aircraft gun and fight on? Let me close today with the well-known poem entitled Flanders Fields. Many of you will be familiar with it, but for others, maybe our younger generations, it's probably gonna feel new again today. I'm sure you've heard it previously. But let me share it with you as we close. It was the references in this poem to the red poppies that grew over the graves of the fallen soldiers that resulted in the remembrance poppy becoming one of the world's most recognized memorial symbols for soldiers who have died in conflict. The author was inspired to write it on the 3rd of May, 1915. John McRae, after presiding over the funeral of a friend and fellow soldier, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, who had recently died in battle. 
Initially dissatisfied with what he'd written, he discarded it. Someone picked it up. And at the insistence of this friend, he retrieved it and shared it with a magazine called Punch, who published it. Within a short space of time, it became the most quoted poem, or one of the most quoted poems from the war. This is what it says. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved, and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. It's written from the perspective of the fallen. But it's a call from beyond the grave, as it were, to each and every one of us who has opportunity to catch that torch, to not break faith with those who gave for our freedom. So this weekend, let us remember the Anzacs. May their service to us ever point us to the sacrifice of Jesus, the one who alone is worthy of all glory and honor and power and praise. And like Teddy Sheehan, may we fight on for those who need us. May we not sit idly by in the face of injustice, but may we take up our quarrel with the foe and to be people of peace who are also at war with those who need, for those who need our protection. Lest we break the faith with those who died for our freedom, lest we forget.